All right, so let's talk about game dev. So first of all, who I am? I'm uh, Valentin. I'm doing like games now more than 10 years, both small and big, like your AAA, your indie games. Now I'm working on uh, in Splash Damage in London, and this is kind of my vanity plate of like stuff I've done. Um, first, uh, a disclaimer, like this, due to some scheduling, this is a shorter and better kind of version of a longer talk that I did one year ago in uh, in London. Uh, we have a um, uh, C++ meetup. So if you like what you're going to see today, uh, I suggest you, you check out the bigger, broader, broader picture. Still, on the agenda, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a bit of a, f a context to see where game dev is coming from and what the particular needs are. And then we're going to have this pattern. I'm going to show you some, like the badlands. We're going we're gonna to talk about how we deal with STL, how we deal with boost exceptions, and maybe a bit of um, reflection at the end. So. Um, yeah, so just like that recap I promised you about. Like, we're going to just quickly see where the industry is, what kind of platforms are they um, using, compilation technique, coding styles, and stuff like that, right? So uh, previously on, the, on, on this TV series, we had, like, we discussed about ty types of games, right? You have your AAA games, which are, like, traditionally the big budget one, the, the one with, like, big marketing budgets, right? You have your independent kind of garage development. You have a mobile games that everyone has on their phones. Then uh, we talked about how this industry, right, tends to be very competitive, very kind of highly secretive about how it's doing things, right? Then uh, I talked about how games, the particular requirements of games, like you have low latency, but at the same, uh, same time high throughput. Uh, oh, thanks, Windows. And so, for example, a low latency, right? You push, a, you push a button on a controller, you want that action, you want that character to jump as fast as possible. But at the same time, we need high throughput, right? There's a lot of stuff moved around memory. You have your, like, from the disk to memory, from CPU to GPU, you got to push those millions of pixels, especially nowadays with, like, 4K and stuff like that, right? Then uh, it's, like, compilers and IDEs. Primarily in games is a uh, Windows Love Affair and Visual Studio. Even if you're doing console work, even if you're doing Clang, it still tends to be uh, Visual Studio driven, although there's, there's some other like SN systems here actually in Bristol, they do some, uh, some good work on tool chains. Uh, then uh, flavors of C++ in games, right? Traditionally games that like go back a while, right? Traditionally it was very C++ 98, but now it's kind of coming back 11, 14, even some glimpses were possible of, of 17. And then primarily it's OOP driven, and we looked at some alternatives like what else is, is there, right? All right, so after this recap, let's start and go and look into, into STL. Let me, let me move this mouse cursor. All right, so first of all, I have here like a personal theory of mine. Feel free to destroy it after the talk and in questions. <laughs> it's like speculative, totally unfounded. But the idea is like adoption of STL in games is very divided. It's like all or nothing kind of affair. And I have this, I don't know, because I worked enough, I have like this West versus East kind of idea. And I see more adoption in the Eastern world and less in like the Western world. Like you see, I kind of weirdly divided, like I consider Germany on the, on the East. Sorry about that. So, <laughs> so that I have not, I don't have enough data to back it up. And I have some secret stuff I cannot talk about. But, you know, weirdly enough, STL was kind of invented in the Western world, but it's like, I don't know, maybe entrepreneurial, get stuff done, so they tend to kind of reinvent the wheel. Whereas in the Eastern world, I come from a Eastern European country, it's like the, the background is more academic, mathematical, the, the iterators, they seem to embrace it more. All right. Uh, why? Why reason for this low adoption, right? Our streams don't use this, they're the devil's work. Nobody likes them in, in game dev. Um, now there's this perceived sometimes true bloat which comes with like when you ingest a lot of STL and I have there a, a link where uh, Neil Douglas in a, in a Google group shows like the, the speed of compilation of parsing of the, of the STL like um, you know includes and it kind of rockets you know skyrockets quite fastly especially if you do like uh, I think the one of the highest offenders was regex. Um, and then it's slow of cumbersome debugging. If you look inside some of these implementations, it's kind of hard to find out what's going on. Uh, not everyone is willing to kind of use. It's like dogmatic, you know, they're not willing to, willing to use like the naming convention. It tends to be very camel case I've seen in game dev. Um, and 
if it started a lot, they, they just reinvent their own stuff, right? More importantly, though, game dev has very specific allocation needs, and here was like the Achilles heel of STL, right? The STD allocator pre C11 was weird, was like stateless, and um, they added now in C17 the PMR, the polymorphic allocator, so more support, right? But it was lackluster. Uh, it's not always a binary choice. You know, it's like you can mix and match. Even if you don't use containers, you can use something else. I've seen that the atomics and the um, locks are generally well received and they're just used as it is, if nothing else. Uh, the iterator concept, again, like it's a good concept. People kind of reinvent it, if, uh, you know, just for nothing else, just to do range four, all right? And uh, algorithms are so, so it was interesting seeing the other talk with the 105 algorithms. Um, for example, a big contender here, Alien Engine, they have their own containers, but they kind of try to keep up to date, so they mirror, they have their own partition, they have their own stable sort, all that stuff, right, in a, in a totally different way, but still, they kind of respect the algorithms enough to kind of recreate them. Uh, all right, and then let's, let's have a case study quickly. So even if you use a STL, you're not gonna use a STD string. Why is that? Because games have a very specialized, like, tight coupling with the game data, right? You have a localization, you, you wanna, um, you know, you know what you're doing, so you, you package it very tightly. Um, also, previous STL implementation did some awkward choices, like for example, GCC for a while did um, <coughs> copy and write implement, uh, optimization, which is not that good in multi-threaded environments. Nowadays, everyone does the small buffer allocation, but you don't have control over it, you don't know how many, you cannot control how many characters up front you reserve before you go to the heap. So again, we're very, you know, game dev tends to be very particular on the, on the, on the needs. And again, it's like weird kind of, things tend to be immutable, you get them from the disk and you just display them as there is less, you do less operation on strings, or people just tend to prefer, you know, printf style, just debugging, right? Now, as an alternative to all this, I'm gonna show you an interesting approach which uh, EA Electronic Arts did. So <clears throat> they started this um, a project 10 years ago when they took STL as it was, like the, the interface of it, but they completely changed the guts, right? So, um, and now it's open source, so you can kind of just uh, take it and, and use it. So how did they change, right? So they kept everything apart from they rewritten it, like they gave up on the generality of it, they made it cross-platform, so that allowed them to, you know, easier to debug, like the code is written in a more straight, straight fashion way, uh, faster release builds. Um, again, very important, they simplified the, the allocator, like they made it more game specific, you can, it's alignment aware, you can tag with like small s strings, like to, to do, to, you know, your pools of memory to keep track of them. They have intrusive containers, so this is an interesting one. If you're willing to, to embed the metadata of the, con of the type, of the container, sorry, in the type, then you can save even more space, right? These are called intrusive containers, like um, a list or something like that, when in, you put the pointer straight into your data, like, um, or the reverse of that, when you fix containers, you have your vector, like a fixed vector, it, all, it can only live in this fixed block, right? So you totally control the allocation. You don't have any surprises. Uh, they add also some new containers, like ring buffer is an interesting one, and there's some, talk to add it maybe in C++ where you have like commands, you push them on one side and you execute them on the other. They have heap, uh, priority queue and stuff like that. Uh, also they used to have like smart point and type trace. These are not absolutely, this is where um, STL actually works better. All right, so in moving on, I wanna introduce like the, the subgroup for game dev SG14, but before here's like a, a quick summary of how things move in C++, right? So there's these green subgroups at the bottom, and they have talks, proposal, papers, and it floats up, right, to the uh, working groups, the core language or the library, and then finally gets uh, pushed into the, into the standard, right? So that's how you kind of get change. And recently, there was this SG4, three, four years ago, I guess, um, SG14, which is a um, study group, specially dedicated for game dev, embedded in finance and deals with these like super low optimizations. Uh, they try to propose new data structure, new changes to the language even. You know, everything that can help and they have like a, a study group there which is fully open. You can just, you know, lurk around. Uh, what, are, what are they discussing? So, 
floating point is not always a good option. Like some platforms don't support it, or there's like slow lack of precision. So doing fixed point is quite beneficial. They're trying to have a library for like fixed point. STD function, everyone loves STD function, even in game dev, but you pay a high price. It will type erase and it will always go to the heap. So there was like an idea to, to have an in-place version. And now they're doing like a string view equivalent, like when you're just passing stuff. So a function ref. Uh, Vittorio here, I think, is pushing this to the standard. Then they have very highly specialized, again, uh, games and stuff working specialized multi-threaded environments, so they're, they're doing RCUs and has a pointers. I think Michael Wong will, will talk more about this the following days. Um, likely and unlikely optimization hints, like attributes you can put on if to like control the hot path and cold path. I think this actually made it to uh, C++20 already. Uh, I'm gonna show you later, we don't tend to use exceptions, so then it's like standardizing alternative ways, your good old C style, you know, um, status code, error code, stuff like that. Uh, and of course, a lot of bike shedding, because that comes with the territory, right? Everyone loves that. Uh, all right, so we saw STL, let's move on to Boost, right? What's, what's game dev attitude towards Boost? And I'm gonna summarize it in this one tweet, right, from a, a very respected guy. He's the creator of Doom and Quake. So I think kind of this puts it in a, in a nice perspective, right, what, uh, what game dev feel about Boost. Um, yeah, why, why though? So um, again, my theory here, feel free to destroy it, um, Boost is a bit more academic research driven, where game dev is like pragmatic, get it done, you always have a release knocking at the door. Uh, historically, it didn't play well with MSDC, right? Like I said, an MSDC tends to be used a lot. Case in point, Boost HANA of Louis still doesn't compile in Visual Studio 2017, but they're getting very close though. Um, now, there were a lot of good libraries in Boost, but by now they made it into the standard, right? So you have your thread, you have your mutex, all that stuff, so it's at least STL adoption is greater, so you, you just get it for free like that. It's difficult to integrate traditionally Boost, especially if you take it the whole way, um, but there's this tool that makes it easier. Um, and yeah, it kind of, especially if you get large parts of it, it will slow down your, your compilation times, right? So it tends to be, uh, tends to be less <coughs> adopted than, than, than STL. All right, moving on, I was like, say, um, exceptions and error handling. Um, again, feel free to kind of, this is a bit contentious, so very rarely used because of the penalty of throwing and catching, so just throwing an exception there, right? compiled with very latest optimization in um, Visual Studio 17, and you get two screens of boilerplate, right? And a lot of people are not willing to, to kind of pay this price, right? So what do they do? Well, when you're doing dev, you don't do anything, you just hard crash, and you have army of QA people to kind of knock on your door, <laughs> right? The human factor. Then uh, it's back to C style, in out parameters and stuff like that. Um, that means if you, if you're giving up exceptions, that means you're making it hard for yourself to treat, uh, to handle errors in uh, constructors. So then I see this tendency to create, to, to have like create, instantiate, begin, and their equivalent destroy and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying they're not totally used. Like outside of the hot path, they're still, your critical code, they're still used. Um, you have your own services, interactions with like, um, you know, operating system and stuff like that. And also there was a reputation kind of, I mean, exceptions now on x64, they tend to be better. They're not that expensive anymore. But already the damage is done because in past generations, the hardware didn't have it. The compiler maker didn't really bother with it. And then the dev was like, oh, how should I use it? Because it's broken. So then the hardware didn't have a chance to repair it. So it was kind of like a loop like this. So the reputation a bit is damaged, right? In traditional like um, game dev houses that have been doing it for years and years. All right. Last point I want to do, reflection in RTTI. Because this is interesting how, how game dev solves some of these problems. Um, the default stuff that C++ provides, the type ID dynamic cast is not enough for game dev. Why? Because game dev has to keep a close, tight uh, connection with like the editor, like the stuff you make the game, and the actual game. You want to you know, tweak values on runtime, you want to even like reload the whole code like as, as fast as possible iteration, right? You understand there's a lot of like classes, serialize them to this from this to network. 
you have like serialization, versioning, all that stuff that like kind of begs for, for reflection, right? And some, some even some systems go for full garbage collection. collection. So what do, they, what do they do? So normally the, the go-to solution is to annotate your like member stuff with like preprocessor-based decorations or like template metaprogramming sometimes. So to, to get for free like the, the generation of uh, you know, registration calls that do extra work. Um, and then you can go the full way when you give up describing stuff in C++ and you do it in this intermediary, you know, proto buffer kind of thing. And then you have dedicated tools that generate the, um, the, uh, the H and CPP files. Or you can look inside of compiler if you want. Like you can analyze some compiler uh, files and, you know, get extra information from there. All right. So I'm going to show you an example of this. So this is Unreal Engine 4. So I have a ship there, the blue thing with the camera or whatever. So you see the ship has a max speed. And I want to be able, this is the editor, it will be in game, the, the maximum speed, but also I want to tweak it fast. So how do you do this? So when you're doing your ship class, somewhere there you have the max speed, right? And you decorate it with this like weird property thing, right? And then you have a tool that munches through this and generates this. Right, like a whole sh like shebang of like you know getters and setters and like a lot of boilerplate, but at least this is hidden from the end user, even the programmer, because he doesn't care about that. He just decorates, and then the end user just sees the nice value and he interacts with it. So that's that's interesting how um, how you get kind of reflection, you know, injected on top of normal C++. And uh, I think I'm uh, out of time. That was it. That was it for me. Thank you. Are we good on questions? Yeah, three minutes. All right. Yes. Uh, I heard a lot uh, of talk about compilation times, but yes. also speaking about AAA games with budgets around millions, like dozens of millions, how can they not afford build servers? I mean, you, it gets so bad, yeah, that you, um, there are solutions out there that do distributed builds. Right, because there's like we're talking here like uh, 10 million lines of code, right? So it gets quite bad, and even a distributed build will have sometimes problems to like um, you know to munch through all this code, and you need to do it like nightly. You need to you know every time someone pushes, rebuild it. So it's, you know, and they're like AAA could be you know the budget, you know how it is. You put more on marketing, then you don't have on the on the, <laughs> on the build farm <laughs> trade-offs, right? <laughs> yes. That's a good question. I mean, we're using, uh, I don't know, our studio, Splash Damage, tends to use um, Arial Engine. And I'm, I'm sure people who, who use Arial Engine know that like a, a full rebuild on a, I don't know, like an i7 kind of type of machine still takes like at least a quarter of an hour, right? Just because it has like a gazillion files. And imagine if you, have, if you want to do that like every time someone pushes. And depends on your hardware, it could go even to an hour. All right. <coughs> Anyone else? It's sold. <laughs> All right, thank you.